So we talk more about the properties of function, including finding the interval on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Um, we talk about how to identify the maximum and minimum values of functions, including local maximum and global maximum, local minimum and global minimum. Uh, we will look into a, uh, the properties on how to define function to be an even or odd functions. And at the end of this lecture, we will talk about the zero of a function graphically and algebraically. So I believe that is one of the questions that you have the test and Maddie's um, help answer the question is what is the zeros? And basically just you look for the value of x such that the function is equal. Um, okay, so any questions? So that's the topic that we're going to cover in this lecture. So let's get started here on increasing and decreasing functions. So instead of spending time in writing down the definitions, I thought I'd just include the definition in the lecture notes so we don't have to spend time and write it out. Everything. Okay. So now graphically, we look at the graph of the function or the graph of the curve. You always want to look at the function or the graph the function from left to right, right? So therefore, when you identify or when you define increasing or decreasing or constant function, always look at the graph. Of the right. Okay. And for the first graph here is the increasing function right? because when you look at the graph left to right, the value of x one and x two. So you can see position in this way that x2 is always greater than x1. And when you say this is an increasing graph, you have that f of x1 is less than f of x2, or the height of the function f of x1 is less than the height of the function of x2. Do with me like that. Okay, so therefore the first picture here is telling you this is a now for decreasing functions, again, you look at the graph from left to right, x1 is always on the left of x2, but in this case, the height of the function at x1 is greater than the height of the function at x2. You all can that the okay. And for the constant functions, again, from left to right, you see that x1 is on the left of x2, but the height at, of the function at x1 is equal to the height of the function at x2. So therefore, on that part of the function is constant. Any question? Yeah. Um, what if it like goes up and down? Um, like from say it's like it goes up and down, and then it ends up at the same um, point. That's really constant. So when you identify increasing, decreasing of constant function, most of the time you will be asked on which interval, of which interval the function is increasing, uh, which interval the function is decreasing, so on and so forth. Right. Um, there will be some cases that the entire function is going to be constant function, or the entire function is going to be decreasing function. And you will see that in certain or Okay. Um, but most of the time, the question is going to be asked. Okay, tell me for this algebra on which the function is increasing, or this algebra on which the function is increasing. Now, let's move on to other definitions. So, the maximum and minimum value. So maximum, that means the highest point, and the minimum is the lowest point. But you need to classify the point, the maximum and the minimum, a little bit further, that to be able to tell what is a local maximum or what is the local minimum. And then later on, we have a different definition that is global or absolute maximum, global or absolute minimum. Okay. So for local maximum, just the highest point where the function came from decreasing to increasing on an interval. So this is quite important for the definitions on an interval.
All right. So it's not going to be always, not going to be always on the highest point on the entire graph. Right. So the local or relative maximum is the highest points on the graph at a certain interval. In a certain interval. Um, and for the definition of local or relative minimum, the lowest point where the function changes from decreasing to increasing on an interval. Um, so you have two different graphs here. So the first graph, this is the maximum, and I call this the local maximum because I can see the uh, this maximum points on a certain interval. And this is the lowest point on the graph, right? Or the lowest point on the interval of considerations. So here I'm going to call the local max. And this is local minimum. Again, local minimum, local maximum only occurs on an interval. Now, let me move on to the um, other definitions for the global absolute. Global or absolute maximum is the highest point on the entire domain. And you can see that the entire domain of the function. And for the low, global and absolute minimum, this is the lowest point. That's a typo here. Oops. The lowest point. Where the function changes from decreasing to e increasing. So as you can tell, a little bit lazy, just copy and paste, right? Without making any changes. Okay, um, so to classify the difference between local value and global value, um, I want to talk about, uh, so let me give you an example. So if you are the oldest person on the entire world, that's global, is, that means you're also going to be the oldest person in the local area. Does that make sense to you? But the other way is not going to be always true. Right? Or if you're the youngest person in the entire world, right? You just you were born this point, right? So that means you're going to be the youngest person locally. You with me on that? Okay. But the other direction is not going not going to be true. All right. So hopefully that gives you some information how to classify or how to identify global value and local value. So let's take a look at this graph right here. So this graph you have, when you look at this graph, you would be able to identify this is the maximum and that classifies global or local. This is the maximum here and the minimum value. Okay. So this one is the highest point on the entire domain. So therefore I say this is a global maximum, but at the same time, this is a local maximum. So you can carry two groups. And this point is global, a local minimum. Yeah. 
Now you might wonder what happened to the endpoints. All right. So there are some specific information that you need to look into when you identify a maximum or minimum value for the endpoints. Okay. So in this case, you cannot classify anything for this endpoint, this two endpoints. Okay. Um, so it's not going to be a global value because this is always the highest point, this is always the lowest graph, right? And so, uh, so this one cannot classify it in four values. Uh, locally, you cannot identify a local value for the endpoints. Okay, why that is the case? Because for the local maximum or local minimum, you always consider that on an interval. You will remember. There's no interval at the end. There's nothing on the left at this point A, right? Or there's nothing on the right at this point B. You all forget that. So there will be no local value at the end. You will hear that. Okay. You can only identify global value at the end points. So therefore, the one here, there's no local values. So local max or mean values cannot be identified. At the endpoints. All right. So hopefully, the first few definitions give you some information how to identify local and global values. Uh, we will log into this in more details a little bit later, uh, but now let's move on to the next definitions. Um, the next definition is turning point. is the fancy name to say that this for your maximum and minimum. So the maximum and minimum values or maximum for your minimum point get grouped together is the turning points. So the turning point, so turning point, occur at the local extreme values. When I say the extreme value, that means the maximum point. And can you highlight local value only? Or when the functions changes from increasing to decreasing. or from decreasing to increasing. Any questions? Questions so far. All right. So for the I think for the next few examples, we're gonna look into how to identify the interval in which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Um, also identify or classify maximum and minimum values. Okay. 
Um, so for, for this course, we're just going to focus on finding those informations using graphs, right? But in calculus one, you will be able to find the information. All right, so let's take a look at this example. List the turning points and identify if they are a relative maximum minimum or absolute maximum minimum. So relative, that means local. Absolute, that means global. So again, turning points are the point at which the function changes from negative, um, from decreasing to increasing, or from increasing to decreasing. Okay, so the turning point R. So this is one turning point. Right, just look at the graph and identify the maximum and minimum values. Right, so this point one, two, three, four. And five. So I have five turning points. Those are negative eight, negative four. I have negative two, comma six, um, zero, comma zero, and two, comma ten, and five, comma zero. Okay, so those are the turning points. Now, can you identify if they are relative maximum, minimum, or absolute maximum, absolute minimum? All right. So what about this point, negative A, negative four? Absolute and relative. Are you with me? Okay. So absolute relative, minimum. What about negative two comma six? Relative maximum, yeah. Just relative maximum. The point zero zero is relative minimum. What about two comma 10? So, right, so you have to be careful when you look at the graph. Right? So you have the arrows half it in. So that means it's going to go up to positive infinity. So there's no absolute maximum. You with me on that? You okay with that? So because of the end here is have they have arrows at the end. So the end behaviors tell you that the curve will go up to positive infinity. Right? Because positive infinity or the concept of infinity, it's just a concept. There's no specific number of that. Okay. So this point two comma ten is only the relative maximum. And five comma zero is relative minimum. Any questions for A? Yes. How come you can have an absolute minimum to the point of What comes from? So like the arrow going to the left, which is negative infinity, and then you've got the negative infinity. Now can you have the minimum? So then you can have the absolute maximum going to positive infinity. Okay. So when you talk about the maximum value, minimum value, you're talking about the y value or the height of the function. Right. So the y value, the lowest point it can get to is negative four. Whereas the heights uh, in the positive direction go to positive.
Now part B, list the interval on which the function is increasing. Okay, so now for this type of questions, uh, list the interval on which the function is increasing or decreasing of constant, you always only use, only use parentheses for the answer. There's no bracket for increasing, decreasing of constant. All right, so now list the interval on which the function is increasing. So I'm going to use different colors here. So this part of the curve is increasing. All right. And for this type of interval, you use the mm -hmm. x value, the x values. All right. So it's go from negative eight to negative two. Negative eight to negative two. Now the part that is increasing is this part from zero to two and this part from five to positive infinity. Does it make sense to any questions? Now list the interval on which the function is decreasing. So this part of the function is decreasing. So you're going to go from negative infinity to negative 8, from negative 2 to 0, and from 2 to 5. So is there any interval on which the function is constant? So no, nice. So the answer is no. Right, so the next concept I want to give you is the even and odd functions. So it's very simple to, when you look at the graph and identify which function is an even function, which function is odd functions. Okay. So for even function, the graph, the graph of the function is symmetrical with respect to the y-axis. So that's the even function. And for odd function, the graph of the function is symmetrical with respect to uh, the origin. So for even functions, the graph of the functions is symmetrical with respect to the y-axis. So WRT in this case is with respect to now for odd functions, the graph of the function is symmetrical with respect to the origin. So algebraically, we have talked about this in lecture. Some lecture. When you talk yeah. about symmetry, right? What lecture is that? There you go. Definitely. Uh, you should know this. Oh, I should know this. <laughs> uh, so some lecture ago, we talk about symmetry of the graph. Nice. What lecture is that? Five. Five. That's good. All right. All right. So lecture five, if you have any uh, um, so that if you have the point of uh, 
have a back and y on the graph, then the point of uh, oh, sorry, x and y on the graph, the functions, then the point x comma negative y or negative x comma y. Okay. More specifically, when you talk about an even function and you want to show that the function is an even function algebraically, you should do f of negative x equal to f of x. And for odd functions, when you want to show this algebraically, you need to show that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. We will have a chance to work on this type of algebraic approach later on in, um, in our lectures. All right, but for now, let's just focus on graph function that again, the even function is the function where the graph is symmetrical with respect to the y-axis and uh, for odd function, the graph, the function is symmetrical with, with respect to the origins. All right, so, any questions on even and odd functions? Example two, given this graph, can you identify the following? So to remain in range, uh, the intercept, list the turning point, and identify a relative x minimum or x minimum. And then identify the interval on which the function increasing, decreasing, or constant, and where the function is if the function is even, odd, or neither. So what is the domain of this function? So the domain is from negative four to four, including four because you have a closed circle. Now, what is the range of the functions? Uh, zero to three, including the zero and three. So for intercept, there are two type of x in, uh, two two type of intercept, x intercept and y intercept. So the x intercepts are negative two comma zero, two comma zero, and y intercepts. It's just zero comma three. How many turning points do you have? Three, four, five. <clears throat> One, two, three, four, five. Three. One. So there are three turning points. So those are negative two comma zero, uh, zero comma three and two comma zero. So negative two comma zero, how could you classify this? Relative, absolute, maximum, minimum, relative minimum, one. And also at the same time, it can carry the absolute as the lowest on the graph. Bless you. So relative and absolute uh, minimum. Zero comma three. Anyone can help me with this? Yes. All right. So relative max and absolute max as well. And two comma zero is the same with negative two comma zero. It should be relative, absolute, minimum. So that for oh, this uh, problem, you cannot say anything about the endpoints. Now the interval on which the function is increasing. So increasing, 
So this part of the curve is increasing. All right, so you're gonna say this is from negative two to zero and from two to four. for decreasing. So this part of the curve is decreasing from negative four to negative two and from zero to two. And for constant, there's no interval on which the function is at. So is this function even function, odd function, or neither? Uh, even function? Even, yes. Okay. So even function? All right, so for the domain, what is the domain of this function? So negative infinity to positive infinity. What about the range? Zero to positive infinity, good. Is f of negative three positive or negative? Positive. Phi, phi any intercept, so x intercept. What is the x intercept here? Negative one. Negative one, zero, and one, zero. Thank you. And y intercept? Zero, two. Zero, two. Thank you. Uh, turning points, we have three turning points. Negative one, zero. Uh, zero, two, and one, zero. So can you classify this negative one, zero? So absolute relative minimum. And the same goes to one comma zero, right? Isn't that amazing technology? Just make copy and paste. The more you study with me, the more you know that I am not lazy. I need to work, still want to get paid a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> All right, now what about zero comma two? Only, only relative maximum, right? Now the interval on which the function is increasing. All right, can someone tell me? Uh, so, so negative. One more time, negative. Negative one to, I uh, increasing, sorry. Negative one to zero and then one to infinity, decreasing, negative infinity to negative one, and then zero to one. Okay, uh, and constant, there's no constant in this case. Is the function even or odd? Even. Um, for what value of x is f of x equal to zero? So x equal to negative one and x equal to positive one. So the last question that we have here for what value of x is f of x equal to zero is similar to what we have in the test. 
<laughs> another way to answer the question is what are the zeros of or when value of x okay so that's lead me to next concept which is the zero of functions you have seen this idea many times already the zero of function that's just another name to say that what is the root of the function or what is the solution of the root, right or what is the x intercept okay now, before I get to details of the zero of a function, I want to go back and mention or want to say something about the notations that we use in writing increasingly getting to all this function is increasing or decreasing. Right. If you notice most of the time, I'm for increasing and decreasing interval into this now and the intervals. Okay. But for domain and range. I use a union notation. So remember, if you go back to lecture eight, okay, or lecture nine, that matters, you will see that is the case for the I use union notation. Now, by convention, the domain and range, you have to, you must use union notations. You cannot list out the interval for domain and range. Let me see if I have more patience. So domain and range, when you write in terms of interval notations, you have to use unions only for intersections. I don't remember when any time we have intersections, but uh, union intersection notations only. Okay. Now, for increasing, decreasing interval, increasing, decreasing, you can either list out the interval or use union notations. Either one should work. Okay. You with me on that? The reason is that for the domain and range, you need multiple interval to make up the entire domain or range. Therefore, there's always need to be union. Okay, you with me? Now for increasing and decreasing interval, just one interval should tell you the increasing or decreasing part of the function. That's it enough, you with me? You don't have the union, you don't need the union to tell that Okay, the function is increasing or decreasing. It's just one part is increasing, one part is decreasing. Should that does help with the notation? Okay. So for increasing and decreasing interval, if you list out the intervals or if you use the union notation, it should be fine. It should, should totally be fine. Sure. Uh, I don't have a preference on this, whatever you like, but for the domain in range, you have to use union notations. You cannot list out the value, the, the interval. Um, so let me move on to the next concept, which is zeros of the zeros of a functions, okay. All right, um, so for any real number r, and if f of r equals zero, then r is from the real zero of the functions. Right. So there are four different names that you can follow. Uh, let me find the correct name for this. Just want to make sure that I have it correctly. So R can be named, R is a view root of F of R equal to zero. So in addition to having the name real zero, 
can say r is the root of the, the equations f of r equal to zero. So r is an x-intercept of the graph. So for the article here, should I use a or n? When I say that this cell would be nicer when I say n is the intercept, but technically it should be a x intercept. In writing, this is a x intercept, but when you say it, it's n x intercept. So I think But correctly, it has to be a x intercept, right? Yeah. What is the vowel? <laughs> a, 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 yeah, yeah. So A, a x starting with. So the vowel is A E R I O U. Oh. <laughs> but this is good. This is correct. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure that I get it. All right. Good. Uh, or is can carry the name it's the real solutions of f of x equal to zero and then the last one is very helpful when we get to something called polynomial functions when you want to factor a polynomial function that is x minus r is a factor of f of x Okay, so for example, if I have this x squared plus x minus two, if I stick this expression with f of x, I have a function. Okay. Now, if I remove this f of x and I set this equal to zero, I have an equation. Okay. And you can actually solve this equation by a lot of technique. Uh, one of the techniques is you, know, you factor the polynomial, um, the quadratic expressions into x minus one times x plus two. Okay, so when you solve this, you have x equal to one or x equal to negative two. You with me on this, right? So one or negative two, you can say this is the zero of the functions. It's the x-intercept of the function, it's the root of the functions, right? Or in this case, for the last part, x minus one is a factor of polynomial. Or x plus two is a factor. Okay. All right, so now let's take a look at the graph. Example four, find the zero of the functions. So when I say find a zero, that means there's another name for this, is that can you find the x-intercept of, or can you find uh, the value of x such that f of x is equal to zero. So in this case, the zero are x equal to pi over two, uh, x equal to three pi over two, x equal to five pi over two and x equal to seven pi over two. So at this x value, the function is equal to zero.
Any questions on example four? Now for example five, again, find the zero of the function given the graph. So the zeros are, So can you give me the x value such that the function is equal to zero? Yes. Negative three, two, and five. Yes. Uh, which one? Seven pi over two, you mean? Okay, uh, we haven't talked about rational functions yet, but we talk about rational expressions, okay? So we talk about rational expressions. You have P of X over Q of X, given that P and Q are polynomial expressions, okay? So this is the rational expressions, and again, does not equal to anything, so therefore it's foreign expressions. You have this rational expression and set that equal to f of x or set that equal to an output, we call this rational function. You with me? Okay. Now instead of setting an output, you set this expression equal to zero, then you have a rational equation. Do you see the difference there? Okay. So expressions, function, equation. So in this case, you want to determine the zero of the following rational functions. So that means that you want to find the value of x such that the function is equal to zero. Okay. So you want to find x such that f of x equal to zero. All right. So again, you're looking for x in this case, such that x plus two over x minus six equal to zero. So far so good? Okay. Now, why do I choose rational functions specifically for the example? Because the weird thing. When you solve for rational equations, you just look at or you just take the numerator and set that equal to zero. You don't touch the denominator. The denominator is there for you to find the domain of the function. You with me on that? Okay. So now for the zero, you take the numerator and set that equal to zero. Therefore, you get implies that x plus two is equal to zero. And you solve for x, in this case, x equal to negative two. Okay, again, the denominator is for you to find the domain of the rational functions. Okay. So the domain in this case is x minus six has to be different from zero or x is different from positive six. And x equal to negative two is different from x equal to uh, is different from six. So therefore, the solutions of the rational function or the zero of the rational function is x equal to negative two. The zero of f of x equal to x plus two divided by x minus six is x equal to negative two. So that's the zero.
Now problem B, gonna consider the same thing, right? You want to find the zero of rational functions. So again, what you want to do is you find x value such that f of x equal to zero. Right. So you do two x square over x to the four plus one equal to zero or two x square equal to zero or when you divide both sides for two, you get x square equal to zero and therefore x equal to zero. Now, what is the domain of this function? Again, you don't want the denominator to be equal to zero, right? You want the denominator is different than zero. But in this case, you have x to the power of four to the e to the power. So no matter what you do, you, no matter what value of x you substitute here, okay, you're never going to get a zero. So x to the four plus one, never going to get a zero. You wouldn't need that. Okay. So therefore, the domain is all real numbers, from negative infinity to positive infinity. Since x to the four plus one is always different from zero. Or let me give you a stronger statement. It's always greater than zero. So therefore, you conclude that the zero of the function is x equal to zero. All right, problem C, can you find the domain of this function first, please? So the domain is x minus two different from zero or x different from two. Now you solve for the zero. So that means you're looking for the value of x such that f of x equal to zero. So two x over x minus two equal to zero implies that two x equal to zero or x equal to zero. So obviously zero is different from two. So you conclude that the zero of the function is x equal to zero. Any question on problem C? All right, so D, the domain is x plus four different from zero or x different from negative four. Again, you want to solve for the value of x such that the function is equal to zero. Right, so it's x squared plus two divided by x plus four equal to zero or x squared plus two equal to zero. Now, can you find any value of x such that x squared plus two equal to zero? Any real value of x? 
we would not be able to find any real value of x such that x square plus two equals zero. So therefore, there's no solution. So no zero. No zero. Such that f of x equals zero. Or well, you can conclude that there's no solution. Questions? Really good about yourself. All right. So uh, let's stop right here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a data science event late one um, about half an hour. So if you have time, please attend those. Um, and also for next week, we will not have a quiz next week due to the no day yesterday. So I don't have enough materials to cover. Uh, but I will set up some homework for you to do. And we don't have class on Monday. I well, think it's the president. It's the All right. So I will see you on Tuesday of next week. Have a good long weekend, everyone. Thank you. Probably that all online. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Should be online.